welcome back to Prime of Midlife. This is my third time trying to make this video. The first time I cut myself off there, the second time I cut myself off there. So hopefully this time we can actually see me. Um, this is not a preppers video. Um, this is very much an opinion video and it's one that I felt I just had to get my voice out there just to say it's so obvious what's happening just now with the media treatment of the unions in the UK. Um, they are just being vilified and I think we need to be very careful what we believe when we are listening to the media about the unions. Um, at the moment the Daily Mail is absolutely going after them and the BBC this morning were like what do you think about the unions crippling the country etc etc. Um, when I was younger, I remember in the 70s it was the three day week and the unions were getting blamed for everything and then of course there was the miners with Maggie Thatcher and unions were, we were told how dreadful they were and that they crippled the country, however, unions gave the workers some rights, they gave them such a better life. And yes, some of it can seem silly nowadays, but for every comment that this article that I'm going to talk about today had, there was a basis for each rule that this guy's talking about. So this was an article that was out yesterday in the Daily Mail and the start of the headline is The Mad Militant Gravy Train. And it's basically a guy going through the rules that unions have for the trains and how dreadful they are and how silly they are. Actually, they're not. They've been based in truth. They've been based in working practices. Now, the first one that he's talking about is the walking allowance. And he says, oh, why are they getting paid, you know, 10 minutes to walk to their break room? Um, I'm quite sure any Amazon warehouse worker would love to have a walking allowance so that in their 30 minute break, they don't lose 10 minutes walking to the break room and 10 minutes walking back. As I'm sure you can imagine for the train stations in the big cities with the multiple platforms, there's a lot of platforms where drivers pull in and they have got to get out through the people into their break room and that takes time. So because of that, the unions obviously at some point in the past have said, well, actually it's not fair if our guys lose their break time just because of the distance that they have to walk. I think that's perfectly reasonable. And I think there's a lot of people just now would love to have that rule. The other thing that he has said about is, now, where is it? Um, There we go, hang on. Any conversation with the boss class counts as work. Imagine your line manager stopping to say hello when you're on a formal break. In the real industry, that rule book decrees that the break then has to restart from the beginning. Now, I presume it depends how you read that rule book. Possibly if you want it to do that, then it could. However, there's many of us who have been sitting on our breaks <clears throat> and the supervisor or the boss comes in and goes, oh, can you just do this? Can you just do that? How many of us, um, when there's not a proper break room, and even if it's belting down the rain outside, you have to go outside because you know you will be expected to work. If you're at your desk or in the building, then you're expected to work. The only way you will get a proper break is if you leave the building. So it's not by any manner of means, oh, if the boss says, even so much as says hello to you, then your break is cancelled. That's not what it's for. What it's for is to stop supervisors, line managers, etc. Just coming up to you in the middle of your break saying, oh, can you just do this? This has been put in place so that your break is actually your break. And I know there's many of you out there are in the situation where even if you're on a break, it doesn't count. The boss comes and gets you anyway. Um, repairs. Seemingly engineers on Network Rail. Now, Network Rail, according to this, manages Britain's track and signals. Remember, that's manages Britain's track and signals. And seemingly engineers refuse to carry out repairs outside their specified areas. Now, I can understand that. 
If I'm based in Southampton, I do not want to be doing repairs in Glasgow, thank you very much. And if there is, like there has been, like Storm Arwen, I'm quite sure that yes, people will help each other out. But also, I'm quite sure that I don't want to be moving to the worst affected area for the next week to be doing the repairs. Now, yes, you could look at it stupidly, as the guy in the Daily Mail does, and says um, that means that Euston and King's Cross are not allowed to help each other. Well, yes, it possibly does, but there was a reason for it, and the reason was so that you couldn't get, you know, traversed halfway around the country to do repairs. Um, train drivers can refuse to allow ScotRail to phone them at home to inform them of changes to shifts. Yep. Now, I have worked in a job where I have had to cover shifts or the business had to close. And believe you me, if the next day I needed a shift cover, I don't care if it's your day off at all. I will be phoning you. I will be phoning anyone I can think of to try and get these shifts arranged. And especially for somewhere like the railways where there's timetables and you're like, oh, John will do that, but if I can get Steve to do that, then maybe Billy will do that. Oh, right, let's just change that round. You could be phoning them four or five times a day on their day off. Nobody deserves that. If it's your day off, you should be allowed your day off. And if they want to then change your shift, I mean, they're saying here, oh, well, it's ridiculous. Um, they have to then get letters delivered via taxi. I'm quite sure it's not officially written down that it has to be a taxi that delivers it. Um, but yeah, they pop a note through your door so that when you get up the next morning for your shift, you know what's happening. I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong in trying to make sure that when you're on a day off, you're actually on a day off and you do not need to worry about work. Um, there's another thing here saying if they've taken medication, they could demand to be sent home in full pay. Well, I know that coding to me is nothing. Um, coding to my colleague Mandy, Oh no, she's useless, she can't take it. She, she just is useless. So yeah, she would have to go home for the rest of the day. Um, those who'd undergone a routine medical exam lasting more than half an hour were also entitled to take the rest of the day off. What makes us think that if someone's going for a routine medical exam, they should be doing it in, just before they go to work? Should that not be on your day off anyway? And also, I happen to know of some people who have had routine medical exams that shouldn't really have had any problems and they ended up having seizures and things. So, yeah, if it's someone driving a train at that sort of speed, I would rather they would have had that done on their day off. Or they at least didn't have to work the rest of the time. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous that, you know, they're saying here, if services were running late, Workers could refuse to board a train if the delay would result them moving into overtime, even for a few minutes by the time they got home. Again, that just sounds so bad. It sounds like no one's willing to do anything. If the worker is asked to jump on the 12 o'clock from, uh, from King's Cross to Inverness, the first stop is two hours away. So what, has he got to keep that train going? And what if they don't find someone in York to take the train the rest of the way? He's two hours past his time. You know, it's you should. This is not how the railway should be running. And they're saying that um, you know this antiquated law that says that they don't have to work on a Sunday. Now it goes back to nineteen nineteen. Prevents the vast majority of rail companies from requiring employees to work on the Sabbath. This rule was made in 1919. It says a lot for the real management if they have not managed to negotiate with the real workers and the real workers unions that they work five out of seven. So no, this is not the union's fault. What the unions have done has given workers a break, given them a chance to be treated like decent human beings and not be worked into the ground. And the media and the government are vilifying the unions and vilifying the workers. Now, to be honest, I don't remember who it is that's also thinking of going on strike because they're getting offered a 2% pay rise. Inflation is almost 10%. We've already had the increase in energy prices and it's going up again in October and they're getting offered 2%. That is going to be a loss of wages. Their spending power is going to go down so much.
if they get a 2% pay rise? Why? Why can't we have unions? The only thing that workers have got going for them at the moment is the chance of working collectively to make sure that they don't get treated as disposable assets by the multi-millionaire corporations that control the media, frankly. So, yeah, don't believe everything you read about the unions and about the workers, or we'll go back to the Victorian times when they literally were worked to death. Now that I've got that off my chest, I hope you have a good day. Tune in later this evening when I will be going through my prepper stockpile and letting you know how I'm getting on. Sorting that out. See you later.